Welcome to Patriot Radio New Orleans with Jim Fetzer and Gary King, your host. We've been doing a peer review of Black Ops 50 Reasons for 50 Years. We're on episode... It was actually Jim Fetzer involved, and I understand there's some heavy editing. We've got a lot to do. Hang tight. Let's get busy. Black Op Radio presents 50 Reasons for 50 Years. Why the Warren Commission may be the greatest fraud perpetrated on the American public. Now your host, Len Osanek. In this week's episode, Jim Fetzer reveals the failings of the Secret Service in protecting the presidential motorcade in Dealey Plaza. I'm Jim Fetzer, the editor of Murder in Dealey Plaza and other books on the assassination of JFK and many articles as well. The other members of the detail have apparently left to uh, go into the follow-up car, which will be the car immediately behind the president's car uh, in the motorcade. The Secret Service are following the car out. They're standing on the running board of the follow-up car, and as is their custom, until the president's car picks up speed, usually about 20 miles an hour, run alongside of the car. When the car is moving, the Secret Service drop back, jump into the follow-up car, and stay right with him. The driver of the follow-up car keeps his car about no more than 10 feet at the uh, maximum, and usually about six feet behind the presidential car at all times, regardless of the speed. I'd just like to make a few observations about the Warren Commission. The big picture on the assassination is this. We have more than 15 indications of Secret Service complicity in setting him up for the hit. The military intelligence unit was ordered to stand down. They should have been distributed throughout the city in order to provide protection for the president. Instead, the crowds were allowed to build up and spill into the street. 8, 10, 12 deep open windows along the motorcade route. The manhole covers were not welded shut. The motorcycle escort was cut down to four, and the police officers were instructed not to ride ahead of the rear wheels. One of the officers observed this was the damnedest formation he'd ever seen. Not only were they on a change route, which ordinarily the Secret Service never does because they have to investigate all of the buildings along the entire route, all the occupants who would be there, so they ordinarily fix a motorcade route and never change it. But this one not only included a 90-degree turn off of Main Street onto Houston, but a 110-degree turn back onto Elm Street, which was another violation of Secret Service protocol which I'm convinced was done to slow down the limousine without alarming the occupants. Then most astonishingly, William Greer, the driver, after bullets had begun to be fired, pulled the limousine to the left and to a halt. Then came the official announcement that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th president of the United States, was dead. Blood was wiped from the presidential limousine as it was parked outside the hospital's emergency entrance. And by the time they got to Parkland Hospital, a Secret Service agent took a bucket of, of water and a sponge and began washing the blood and brains out of the limousine, which, of course, was the destruction of a crime scene on wheels. There was actually a through-and-through -through bullet hole in the windshield. Several uh, civilians had observed it. A police officer actually stuck a pencil through it. As soon as the Secret Service noticed the attention, they moved the limousine where it wasn't publicly accessible. And then on Monday, the day of the formal state funeral, the limousine was sent back to Ford Motor Company. It was completely stripped down to bare metal and rebuilt, destroying a major crime scene on wheels. Those were the actions of the federal government in seeking to investigate the death of your president and mine, John F. Well, it's very curious, Gary. This even appears to be a revised edit of the original Len posted, which was not the original he taped. For example, I began explaining how two agents were left behind at Love Field as the first of the 15 points I was going to make, which was shown in the video, but not my words describing it. Um, and uh, then it's uh, fine up to where I talk about the limo being brought to a halt after bullets began to be fired. Uh, I then explained that JFK was hit twice during this interval, once in the back of the head, that he slumped forward, that Jackie eased him back up, and was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by a frangible or exploding bullet. He then slumped to the left, 
gradually, not the violent back and to the left we see in the extant version of the Zapruder film, which was a result of the way they edited the film in seeking to combine the two headshots. Uh, but in addition, you know, Clint Hill had rushed forward to assist Jackie. She climbed out the back of the trunk after a chunk of Jack's skull and brains, and he pushed her back, lay across the bodies, peered into a fist-sized hole in the back of JFK's head, then turned to his colleagues and gave them a thumbs down, all before the limousine reached the triple underpass. Um, when I asked Len what had happened, uh, including that he had done two other interviews with me, one very specifically on the alteration of the Zapruder film, which was an expansion of the remarks I just made in considerable detail, and yet a third on the Alton Six and the evidence that Oswald was actually in the doorway captured in that famous photograph during the shooting, he told me that others had told him that if I were included that they would not participate and I was astounded that that should be the way it played out. Uh, obviously, in my opinion, Lynn Osanik should have stood his ground and not permitted himself to be censored or edited by others who, if they chose not to participate, in my opinion, he should have told them, so be it, and excluded them, not me. I thought the JFK movement and the JFK researchers were all in a common pursuit of the truth. Am I mistaken? The fact of the matter is, I once remarked to Gordon Duff, the editor-in-chief of Veterans Today, that I thought 50% of those in the JFK research community were working for the other side. Gordon corrected me and said it was actually 90%. I'm sorry to say, but there are an awful lot of those out there who are very eager to see the truth is suppressed and distorted. And it's, uh, you know, I, I have long since identified any number of them. If you go on to Veterans Today, Jim Fetzer, you'll see under the heading of the JFK War, I've been systematically proceeding through the research community to identify, expose, and present the evidence that supports my conclusion that they are, in fact, working for the other side. Mm -hmm. So is it the one holy grail that cannot be revealed is that the Secret Service complicity in stopping limousine until it was all over and then dreaming? Is that the one thing that no one can go? Can no one can go there? Am I right? Actually, the Secret Service complicity extended beyond my observations in this interview with Leno Sanic because Roy Kellerman in particular accompanied the body all the way to Bethesda Hospital. Of course, it was secretly offloaded from Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base and put aboard a helicopter taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital where bullets fragments were removed and then transported to the Bethesda morgue in a black hearse uh, where it was offloaded in a pinkish gray shipping casket uh, and was inside a body bag so that the autopsy was actually already taking place when Jackie Kennedy and the official entourage in the with a bronze ceremonial casket in the gray ambulance showed up at the front. Gerald Custer, who was the radiology technician who actually took the x-rays, was heading upstairs in the company of two Secret Service men when he ob observed this happening out the front window and thought it was very, very strange because the body was already in the morgue and the autopsy was already in progress. Roy Kellerman would gather the autopsy x-rays, which had both been both exposed and developed, and the autopsy photographs, which had been exposed but not developed. And the next time they turn up, they have been altered and changed in ways intended to support the official account of the assassination. Uh, when we're talking about the Zapruder film only, now it seems that it, that has to be the holy grail that cannot be gone, no one can go there, is about to see the limousine stopping. In fact, Dr. Fetzer, I have a clip of Walt Brown describing the scene as far as the limo actions in Dealey Plaza. Let's comment on that one. The driver was slow to hit the gas pedal. Part of that was because he couldn't hit the gas pedal until he was told to do so. The driver could not take evasive action until he was ordered to take evasive action. When you realize that there's a, a sound that went pop, that a lot of people thought was a firecracker. By the time the mind processes that as a shot, the person giving the order, Roy Kellerman, looks in the back seat, sees something wrong and says, get out of here, we're hit. That takes several seconds, and we're only talking about six seconds. 
And then the car, of course, weighed 7,900 pounds and had 1,000 pounds of people in it. It's not going to do a runway takeoff like an airplane. Well, that's a very interesting clip you have, Gary, because uh, Walt Brown is obviously placing much too much uh, faith in the Zapruder film. He seems not to understand that it's been massively edited, taking out the limo stop with such a blatant indication of Secret Service complicity, it could not be allowed to stand. Uh, not only, and this is quite ironic, all things considered, did Josiah Thompson have a completely uh, brilliant, detailed graph and analysis of the double hit theory in six seconds in Dallas, which I currently feature in my presentations, including JFK at 50, the who, the how, and the why, which you and I produced together. But uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel-winning physicist from Caltech, confirmed the double hit when David Lifton visited him there and gave him photographs, blow-ups of the key frames where he measured and determined that between frame 312 and 313, JFK's head goes forward. And then from 314, uh, 17, and so forth, it's back into the left in a violent motion that no one in Dealey Plaza observed. And what has happened here is that in attempting to merge the two shots, they left out the further forward motion or slumping of JFK, uh, where Jackie then eased him up and was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by that frangible or exploding bullet that set up shockwaves that blew his brains out the, the, the back of his head to the left rear with such force that when they impacted with Officer Bobby Hargis riding there, he initially thought he himself had been shot. But then he simply slumped to the left. In editing the film and merging them together, they took out too many frames and created the impression of a violent back and to the left, which uh, did not, in fact, take place in Dealey Plaza and is not part of the authentic film. And, in fact, we have a half a dozen who've actually observed what appears to be the unedited film, though they tend to refer to it as an, another film, not wanting to make the claim that it's necessarily the unedited Zapruder, or what now passes for the Zapruder film. But the fact is that Walt Brown, it seems to me, is a, is a good guy who has displayed uh, bad judgment here by not coming to grips with the reality that the film was massively revised. And indeed, I think your observation is correct that this is the most important secret uh, of the assassination because it blows apart the government's entire account uh, along with the, the fact that uh, Lee Oswald was captured coincidentally observing the motorcade as the shooting took place in the doorway of the book depository which obviously means that not only could he not have been the lone gunman he could not have even been one of the shooters, and where I'm therefore especially troubled that Leno Sanic would allow pressure to lead him to exclude the two interviews he did with me on precisely those two absolutely crucial points, if anyone wants to understand the assassination of JFK. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I, I like to talk to the real witnesses. Let's check with them right now. Well, I can recall seeing the president's car turn onto Houston Street off of Maine, make a right in turn, could travel that short block the distance and turn left on to, to uh, Hell. Yes. Of course, the crowd was very excited, just as we were, to see the president of the United States. And as the car came towards us, he was out about the width of one lane yes. from the curb lane. As he came towards us, the first two shots rang out, and it was a boom. Boom, about like that. They were a hundred or so feet probably from us, but as the car got closer to us, I could see Governor Conley in, in, uh, in the car and him more or less stretched out and the blood on his shirt and his protruding eyes. And just about that time, the car passed in front of us and about as close as I am to Steve, probably some 10, 12 or so feet out from us. The third shot rang out, and I can recall seeing the side of President Kennedy's head blow off. I could see a mass of white and then the blood and fragments, and I turned to Gail and said, that's it, hit the ground. Yes, sir. We turned around and threw our kids back 
on the uh, grass and covered them there. And uh, I can remember looking back and you know and seeing the car slow down or nearly come to a complete stop and then accelerate and take off and go out of sight into the triple underpass. And when I say stopped, I only talk, I only mean that like you hit apply the brakes and then get off the brakes and take off. It was when I look back. I, but you know, in the Sapruta film, it never shows the car stopping. You know, if I say stop, then somebody interprets that, that the car stopped for 30 seconds or a minute or a long period of time. I do think the car stopped momentarily. And when I say momentarily, I'm just talking about looking over and seeing the brake lights and it hit and kind of rocked the car. And one of them had, you know, a two-way radio or phone or something to their ear. And, uh, and then they floorboarded it, you know, by the time the Secret Service got over and the agent got over in the car, the other Secret Service agent, they floorboarded and took off. So we're just talking about seconds. It had always seemed to me that had the car speeded up, had there been better reaction on the part of the driver, they were only yards from what at least I perceived to be safety by getting on the expressway. But the car seemed to just, it didn't move. After that first shot, it just didn't move. This is not to be shown publicly, mm -hmm. but that, that guy slowed down. Maybe he, his orders was to slow down where the rest of the guys... Were. This is Greer, the, the driver of the presidential limousine. Yeah, presidential yeah. limousine. Yeah. Slow down almost to stop. All right, this is episode 21, the strange goings-on around the Texas theater and also the Mexican jumping bean bullet casing shells that seem to be all over the place. Now your host, Len Osanek. In this week's episode, author John Armstrong discusses the events leading to the arrest of Lee Oswald at the Texas Theater. My name is John Armstrong, and I'm the author of the book Harvey and Lee. Oswald's arrest uh, resulted from a theater cashier's tip, Mrs. Julie Postal telephoning police from the Texas Theater, that a man inside looked like he was running from someone. She said he kept changing seats in the theater. The Dallas Police Department took down the names and phone numbers of 24 persons identified as being inside the Texas Theater at the time of Oswald's arrest. That list soon disappeared, and very little effort was made to establish eyewitness accounts of what happened inside the theater. The official story has Oswald sneaking into the theater at approximately 1.45 p.m. and arrested a few minutes later. But Butch Burroughs, who ran the theater's concession stand, sold Oswald popcorn at 1.15. Jack Davis, who was attending the double feature, said that Oswald sat down beside him in the almost empty theater as the main feature began around 1.20. Oswald soon got up and sat down directly beside at least two other people. Burroughs believes Oswald entered the theater about 1.05 p.m. and first went up to the balcony. The Dallas police came into the theater looking for a suspect from the Tippett Slate. They were looking for a man in a white shirt who was reported to be in the balcony. Indeed, the first officers inside the theater went directly to the balcony. Another group of police came into the theater from the alley, entering the auditorium from behind the screen. With the house lights now on, they slowly converged on Oswald, seated on the main floor wearing a dark shirt. There was a brief scuffle, and Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested and taken out the front door. Soon after that, witnesses in the alley saw police take a man who looked like Oswald, wearing a white shirt, out of the theater and put him into a squad car. Initial police reports stated that the suspect had been arrested in the balcony. Two witnesses independently placed Oswald inside the Texas theater before 1.20 p.m. Butch Burroughs testified before the Warren Commission but was not questioned about anything which happened before 1.35 p.m. The Dallas police never produced a list of witnesses from inside the Texas theater. The Warren Commission never followed up with the Dallas police or the FBI on the issue. Stay tuned for the next installment as we expose week after week 50 lies the Warren Commission would like you to believe. 
Hi, Dr. Fetcher. The Texas Theater and the strange goings-on in the Oak Cliff area. In this uh, brief but important uh, clip, uh, John Armstrong makes several significant points, including that uh, Oswald may have entered the theater as early as 105, and certainly was there at the latest by 115, which is very significant since uh, Officer J.D. Tippett was uh, gunned down a, a considerable distance away uh, between 110 and 115, which makes it impossible that Oswald could have been the gunman. Uh, we knew that, of course, from evidence at the scene and that Aquila Clemens identified two men neither of whom resembled Oswald as the actual shooters. In addition, he mentions that Oswald was wearing a dark shirt, of which you get a brief glimpse when he's brought out of the theater. That shirt was a very unusual, richly textured shirt, uh, in which he was actually wearing when he was standing on the steps of the book depository and was captured in the famous photograph by James Ike Alchins but where the police had him remove the shirt before they booked him so that he would be wearing a white t-shirt. And as Armstrong also observed, someone who was wearing a white shirt, who appears to have been a lookalike, was taken out the back of the theater. All of this is very damning, very incriminating uh, of the police as setting him up as a patsy, but also exculpating of Oswald as having been responsible for the shooting of J.D. Tippett. This is a very nice piece and valuable addition to the 50 points. Some of these black op episodes are taken in a whole segment. What do you think we plow through a couple of them? I think that's a great idea, Gary. Let's go for it. Black Op Radio presents 50 Reasons for 50 Years Why the Warren Commission may be the greatest fraud perpetrated on the American public. Now your host, Len Osanek. Lee Oswald's been arrested. He's taken to the Dallas Police Headquarters. He's being interrogated by Dallas detectives. He's got two pieces of contrary ID. Alec Heidel, Lee Oswald. While they're trying to figure out exactly who they have in custody, J. Edgar Hoover's already on the phone to Bobby Kennedy saying, we have our man in Dallas. Author, researcher, Jim Mars explains just how it is that Lee Oswald came to be under suspicion so quickly. This is Jim Mars, author of Crossfire, the plot to kill Kennedy. How did they know to go after Lee Harvey Oswald? Like so much else in this case, it seems pat on the surface. But once you dig into it, there's too many questions here. Officially, the story is less than 10 minutes after the shooting, the police were putting out a broadcast saying, be on the lookout for a slender white male, about 165 pounds, 5 foot 10 inches, in his early 30s. Here's the question, where did that come from? And the answer is, nobody freaking knows. A cop called in and said some bystander had given him this description. This actually didn't match Oswald, who was lighter than that, shorter than that, and younger than that. Then we get the story that they held a head count at the Texas School Book Depository, and Oswald was the only one missing. This was the guy we needed to go after. But you'll find that that falls apart, too. At the time of the shooting, most of the people in the book depository were outside. They all went outside to look at the present going by. And then when the shooting happened, some of them were in shock, some of them stumbled around, some of them went back in the building and got caught when they sealed the building off, which was not for 15, 20 minutes or more after the shooting. And some of them were outside and could not get back inside. So apparently there really was a head count taken about 1 o'clock. The assassination happened at 12.30. But there was all kinds of people missing. So about 2 o'clock, they held another head count. And by this time, they had counted for everybody except Lee Harvey Oswald. But by that time, he was already in custody. How did they know to go after him? Lieutenant Jack Rebel, who was the police intelligence officer of the Dallas Police, has said publicly that he rode back from Dealey Plaza 
to the Dallas police station with a military intelligence agent, an agent from the Office of Naval Intelligence. And Oswald was a Marine, which is a department under the Navy. Lieutenant Revel goes back to police headquarters and types up a list of the employees of the Texas School Book Depository. Heading his list is Harvey Lee Oswald of 605 Elspeth. Oswald had never lived at 605 Elspeth, but he had lived at 602 Elspeth back in the fall of 1962. But this information was nowhere on any of his employment forms at the Texas School Book Depository. So where did this information come from? At the time of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, a Colonel Robert Jones of Army Intelligence testified that he had operatives in Dallas who told him that a suspect had been arrested and his name was Alex James Hydell. He went and checked Army Intelligence files and found out that there was a military intelligence file on an Alex James Hydell and it crossed index to Harvey Lee Oswald of 605 Elspeth. The very same two mistakes that we find on Rebel's typed list from the Dallas Police Department that was typed up about an hour or so after the assassination. This tells us U.S. military intelligence tipped off the Dallas police as to who the suspect was in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This is only one of several incidents involving military intelligence, which has rarely been looked at as a suspect in the assassination Oswald was pulled screaming and shouting from the Texas theater by officers who had gone there on a tip that Oswald was there. He brandished a pistol which officers took away from him after a struggle. Oswald was quoted as saying, it's all over now. When Captain Fritz, based on the second and final head count at the book depository, he was telling his detectives, I think we need to, to go out and find this Lee Harvey Oswald. And one of them said, well, that's funny because he's sitting right there in the office because he's the one they brought in from the Texas theater. It was just phenomenal police work. According to FBI documents that were released to the public in the 1980s, less than two hours after the shooting, Jagger Hoover calls Attorney General Robert Kennedy and says, we have our man in Dallas. It's Lee Harvey Oswald. He's an ex-Marine. He defected to Russia. He's a mean-spirited individual in the category of a nut. He's already pushing the lone nut theory less than two hours after the shooting to Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Now, why is this important? Well, because... Oswald was arrested in the Texas theater. Put him in a car and they drove him downtown to the police station. And so uh, less than two hours after the shooting, he's just arrived at the police station. And the police find that he has two sets of identification on him. One says he's Lee Harvey Oswald. The other says he's Alex James Hydell. And they're saying, well, which one are you? And he's been uncooperative. He said, well, you're the cops. You figure it out. So at a time when the authorities in Dallas weren't even sure of who they had under arrest, Hoover is on the phone in Washington talking to Bobby Kennedy and has the whole lone nut scenario worked out along with Oswald's background. In Dallas, the prime suspect still is being questioned. He is 24-year-old Lee Oswald of Dallas, a former Marine who spent some time in Russia, who at one time had applied for Soviet citizenship. He has been associated with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. All right, Dr. Fesser, episode 22, the United States military intelligence tipping off the Dallas police. And what about Hoover having their man within two hours before they even knew who he was? Well, I think this is an extremely good episode by Jim Mars. Uh, it's interesting how many images we see of Oswald in his T-shirt, which was his undershirt, although at the end of the footage we see him in the very unusual overshirt he was wearing, which had a very rich and distinctive texture and appears to have been made abroad, which is the key to identifying the man in the doorway as Lee Oswald. You combine his height, uh, where Jim actually uh, suggests that he was five foot eight, and other sources suggest five foot ten in the employment record that Oswald made out himself, it appears. He says five foot nine. But the fact of the matter is, the person in the doorway wearing the richly textured shirt with a white t-shirt beneath it is about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, He's slender, weighs about 120 pounds. Uh, he has uh, 
you know, very um, uh, unlike features that are very unlike the alternative candidates, such as uh, a Billy Lovelady, who's uh, actually in the doorway beside him, but who is uh, two or three inches shorter and 15 to 20 pounds heavier, and who's wearing a red and white vertically striped short sleeve shirt, which he showed to the FBI. And then another figure who's been claimed to have been the man in the doorway is wearing a red and black check shirt and must outweigh the man in the doorway by at least 30 pounds, and it's buttoned all the way up to the top. It's clear they already were aware of the problem with the shirt in relation to the Alton 6, and therefore had him take off the shirt. The point that Jim makes about the two mistakes uh, regarding the name and so forth are extremely telling. The name and the address are extremely telling. I think this is a very important contribution to JFK research. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about Hoover having their man within two hours? Well, of course, you know, first impressions are so important. It's like getting out the idea that there were three shots, which Merriman Smith was already announcing from a press car. Uh, as the shooting was taking place. I mean, it's simply ridiculous how many were involved here and how the media was manipulated to create the impression there were three shots when in fact there actually appeared to have been eight, nine, or ten shots. But where three shots were, uh, do appear to have been fired with a man looker Carcano from the Dow Tech. All of the other shots were fired with silenced weapons to create the acoustical impression of three shots having been fired that Hoover was trying to promote the idea they already had the man as part and parcel of the official cover-up. <laughs> All right, let's go on to episode 23 with John Judge. Now your host, Len Osanek. This episode, we shift focus from Dallas to Washington. Longtime researcher John Judge discusses his views on the sudden transfer of power. This is John Judge from Washington, D.C. I'm an independent researcher and investigator into the Kennedy assassination since the late 1960s. The events on November 22, 1963 follow a pattern of a military coup d'etat, in my view. The picture of the flag flying at half-mast, the scene through the trees stripped of their leaves, captures the mood of grimness here at the White House. Outside in front of the White House, crowds have begun to gather, waiting for some visual confirmation of what they and everybody else find so hard to believe, that the president is indeed dead. Right at the moment of the assassination, 12.30 Dallas and 1.30 Eastern Time, the Federal Exchange phone lines, not the Bell telephones, but the exchange lines between government agencies that are secure, went down for a period of two hours. And I know this from both my mother and my aunt who were working at the Pentagon at the time. The nuclear command and control code books were compromised that day. I talked to Strategic Air Command bomber pilots. They told me that they heard radio chatter that the president had been killed in Dallas, but they were not able to locate the decrypting books which they went to get because they thought that they would be given commands. We also know from Pierre Salinger's book with Kennedy that the plane bringing the cabinet back from meetings in Honolulu regarding the war in Vietnam were informed that the president had been shot and Salinger went to the pilot and suggested he take out his decrypting book to see if commands or messages were coming through and there was not a code book on that plane either. Nuclear command and control box, the black football as they call it, that is supposed to stay with the president 24-7 should have transferred immediately to Johnson but in fact the guy carrying it was not on the plane with Johnson when he left Dallas and there were many hours in between when Johnson did not have any control of the situation. That also would have been under the orders of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. People here, as people must be all over the country walking around with looks of stunned disbelief on their faces. In addition to that, the military was preparing that day for a military invasion of Cuba. This, in my view, was the implementation of Operation Northwoods, a joint plan of CIA and Pentagon that Kennedy had rejected. And this was to create a traumatic incident in America that would traumatize the public and could plausibly be blamed on Castro. 
I believe that they made the assassination into Operation Northwoods traumatic incident and were ready to invade Cuba that day on the basis of it. Had they been able to kill or silence Oswald at the theater, had he died, the links to Fidel Castro made by a false Oswald several weeks earlier in Mexico City would have come to light and immediately been used as an excuse to say that Castro had assassinated the president and even Castro himself in a statement three days later raised his suspicions that this was created in a way to set him up. These are elements, in my view, of a coup d'etat that cannot involve anti-Castro Cubans, mafia, or anyone else but the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the top of the military operations. President Johnson, recently installed, arrived at Andrews Air Force Base. Now, new president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, with his wife, Lady Bird. Secretary McNamara and other officials greeting the new president. As he moves now in the direction of an army helicopter. At the National Archives was a file in the National Security Agency folder that had to do with messages coming into and going out of the Pentagon Press Office on the morning of November 22nd, 1963, and into the afternoon. And one of the interesting notes is a rumor the press is checking on with the Pentagon Press Office that General Curtis LeMay, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has died that morning in a plane crash. LeMay was actually in Canada, supposedly on a hunting trip, and then flew back, having gotten word of the assassination to Washington, D.C., but did not land at Andrews in the military airport, but instead at D.C. National, which would put him closer to Bethesda than the Pentagon. And in fact, there are witnesses who saw him sitting in the teaching more bleachers at Bethesda Hospital, uh, watching the autopsy. He was there for that, but out of town during the incident, and also with what I believe may have been a planted cover story that he had died that day if the link to the Joint Chiefs had become evident or if the assassination attempt had failed. General Curtis LeMay hated the Kennedys. He was furious about the Bay of Pigs. He was even more furious and stormed out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which he had hoped would lead to full nuclear war with the Soviet Union, which he thought would be a win situation. Told his aides walking out, we have to get rid of those sons of bitches, meaning the Kennedy brothers. My mother was a manpower analyst directly under the Joint Chiefs. Her job was to project the national draft call. She spent the weekend looking at the news and then went back into the Pentagon and years later told me that that morning, Monday, November 25th, she was handed projections what the national annual draft call would be. She was told to project a 10-year war with 57,000 American dead. So Kennedy, who in fact had been planning a full withdrawal of troops by the end of 1964, was completely completely reversed that weekend in Washington and an entirely new plan for a continued and expanded war in Vietnam was laid out by the Joint Chiefs. All right, what do you think about John Judge and the um, Joint Chiefs of Staff? Gary, I think this is a simply excellent, even extraordinary segment. I think it's extremely valuable. Most Americans are unaware that the uh, the telephone connections were cut in Washington, D.C., among the agencies. I think that was intended to make sure that Kennedy appointees not attempt to, you know, communicate and discuss what had actually happened, and that the missing football and so forth is indicative that the Joint Chiefs were in charge. Only Don Lagarde and I have been investigating, uh, looking into the possibility that the man in, uh, in Mexico City was Walter Tabinsky, who's part of a crime family in Toronto. Uh, the rest of it is, I think, extremely good and valuable, and I'm very favorably impressed with this episode with John Judge. Okay, well, what about LBJ not being in control? Well, that's an interesting suggestion, Gary, but, I mean, you know, Lyndon's uh, key role as the facilitator the assassination is not in doubt and if they uh, you know the chiefs had control of the black box rather than Linda there's no question about him having been the, the guy who was going to you know manage from the beginning to the end for the assassination is as I've explained in JFK at 50 the who the how and the why so I I I would be interested in further information that might confirm that. 
And of course, uh, while all the cameras were focused on LBJ and, and earlier uh, Jackie uh, unloading the bronze ceremonial casket, in fact, uh, JFK's body was actually being taken out the opposite side in a body bag and put into a helicopter to be flown to Walter Reed, where the sh sh different slugs in the body were removed, and then it would be transported in a black purse to the morgue at Bethesda Naval Hospital, where Gerald Custer, while he was heading upstairs with autopsy x-rays exposed to be developed, looked out the front and saw the official entourage with a gray ambulance showing up and Jackie coming into the front. Part of the gross deception involved in manipulating the body and ensuring that the true causes of the death of our 35th president would remain unknown to the public. All right, I think a great segment by John Judge. All right, Dr. Fesser, on to the next one. Your host, Len Osanek. President Kennedy's body was removed from the state of Texas at gunpoint and returned to Washington, where it would undergo one of the worst autopsies in a murder case. Distinguished forensic pathologist Dr. Cyril Weck explains. This is Dr. Cyril H. Weck. I am a forensic pathologist practicing in Pittsburgh and surrounding communities. I am very actively involved. I did 372 autopsies last year. I've done about 18,000 autopsies over the past 50 uh, some years and have reviewed, signed off or supervised in about 38,000 other autopsies. I mention all this background in order to present the basis for my great dismay professionally, setting aside all the important political ramifications, the historical significance of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, to think about an autopsy on the president of my country being performed by someone who has no experience at all in forensic pathology. This is 1960. This is not uh, 100 or 200 years ago. The uh, body of President Kennedy was transported from Andrews Air Force Base to the hospital in Bethesda by a, a Navy ambulance. This is a complex case for the most experienced, astute forensic pathologist. Multiple gunshot wounds, the president, wounds of the governor, the need to correlate the relationships of these various wounds, the sequence, the trajectory, the angle, the distance. This was not an easy case. And to have it performed by Humes and Boswell, who by their own admission, this was to the forensic pathology panel of the House Select Committee on Assassination had never performed a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Now, Pierre Fink, coming over from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, uh, arriving late, an Army guy in a naval setting, attempted to do a couple of things and was quickly put in his place by some gruff voice that we have now come to learn was a four-star general or admiral. The legitimacy of the criticism is the fact that even the people who defend the Warren Commission report, my colleagues, the other eight members, for example, of the Forensic Pathology Panel, and then all others who have addressed this, there remains to this day a great debate about where were the bullet wounds. Can you imagine that? There was only one entrance wound in the head, yes, sir. That was posterior, about two and a half centimeters to the right of the midline posteriorly. This is very important. You say there's scientific evidence. Is it conclusive scientific evidence? Yes, sir, it is. The Ramsey Clark panel in 1968, they moved the gunshot wound to the head up four inches to the crest of the head from the lower part, the external occipital protuberance, where the autopsy pathologist had placed it. Four inches. I mean, you know, you're not talking about something of a minute differential here. So we remain in the year 2013 still arguing about where were the bullet wounds? Was there a wound in the back of the head? Was it on the right side of the head? Is there not a wound on the top of the head? And on and on and on. This is absolutely unbelievable. This was one of the shoddiest, most incompetent, incomplete medical legal autopsies I have ever seen. And the fact that it occurred on the President of the United States of America on a matter of this nature is absolutely incomprehensible. And this is something that we, as the critic researchers of the Warren Commission Report and the 80-85% of the American public that rejects the Warren Commission Report must keep in mind 
It was absolutely a great, great travesty and something that we as Americans, all of us, should be very, very ashamed of. All military personnel were required to sign a document stating they would not discuss any events at Bethesda under threat of court-martial. Well, this is perfectly responsible as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. Uh, and Cyril ought to have cited the brilliant work of David Mantic, who has performed a synthesis of the medical evidence in Murder in Dealey Plaza. Uh, which uh, confirms that he was hit in the back of the head, uh, but that he was also hit in the right temple by a frangible exploding bullet that blew his brains out the back of his head. Notice it nowhere is shown here that uh, JFK had a massive fist size blowout at the back of his head uh, where the brains uh, from the shockwave set up by the frangible or exploding bullet that entered his red temple blew his brains out the rear of his head already weakened by the earlier shot to the left rear with such force that when the impacted motorcycle patrolman Bobby Hargis riding there initially thought he himself had been shot. Now what's absolutely crucial is that physician after physician after physician at Parkland described extruding cerebellar and cerebral tissue having come out of that wound. Uh, which would not have been the case had the pathologist been correct about their location of a single entry wound in the back of the head. Where Bob Livingston, World Authority on the Human Brain, explained to me that unless the tough membrane covering the, te te the cere cerebellum, known as the tentorium, had already been ruptured, it would not have been possible for cerebellar as well as cerebral tissue to have been extruding from that wound, which meant uh, as he analyzed it, that the shot to the throat had hit bone and fragmented part going downward into the right lung, other the other part upward into the brain and severing the, the uh, tentorium. Uh, what Cyril Wecht also omits, and this is fairly stunning, all things considered, is that we originally have this fist-sized wound at, at, at Parkland. We have around 40 witnesses who attest to it. We have physicians like Dr. McClellan and Dr. Crenshaw who have diagrammed it, and I have those diagrams in Assassination Science. 1998, for example, but that if you read the autopsy report, which I also published in Assassination Science, you find the description of the wound at the back of the head is enormous. It, it, it takes off and includes that fifth size wound, but is much enlarged and to take off most of the back and the top of the head. I mean, it's a simply enormous, stunning uh, change which it turns out was actually done by Commander Humes using a cranial saw where he expanded the wound from the fist size wound to the size of a, of a foot. I would compare it to the difference between a heel and the whole foot, which was witnessed by Thomas Evan Robinson, the mortician, and Ed Reed, who was a, uh, a, a specialist there at, at Bethesda, which was exposed by Douglas Horn and published in his five-volume work inside the ARRB um, 2009. Uh, but in addition, then, the HSCA panel on which Cyril Wecht himself served uh, closed up that massive wound, never addressed the blowout as seen at Parkland, and contracts it to a tiny wound, which is then relocated four inches higher at the crown of the head, as he described. He left out that he was a part of the medical panel. And I am increasingly disturbed that we have a lot of evidence that the HSCA was redoing the cover-up to do it better by contracting and concealing the massive blowout to the back of the head for which we have multiple fake photographs coming from the HSCA. So Cyril Weck really ought to have done a whole lot more with this. And I'm uh, very, very disappointed with this particular segment. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll go ahead and close the book on episode 24 and Sarah Wegg for not going quite far enough.